Hello, Tom Cermak again, back with more tips, tricks, and fundamentals of carpet repair and reinstallation. We're going to start with nap direction. Nap direction is a very primary thing. It's the first thing you need to find out. So let's start, let's jump right into it. The first test we do is called the paper and pencil test. Piece of paper and a pencil, and you actually roll the pencil across the paper, and the paper moves in the direction of the nap. Now this is really small, so it's harder for my big fat hands. So I like to use a dowel rod. And I just move it across and the paper goes in that direction. A lot of people say to me, Tom, what if I had the paper turn this way? If you had the paper turn that way, it'd still do the same thing. If you turn the dowel rod this way, it still moves in the same way. This will show you the nap direction, the lay of the carpet every time. And I want to show you why that's important. Let's say I put a piece of carpet in the center of this and I had the nap in the opposite direction it was supposed to be. It would look like that. You would see the difference. If you went to the other side of the carpet, now I'm just going to rotate this, simulating going to the other side of the room, and you would see that you can still see that very evidently and it does not look good. So if you don't have the nap direction correct, you're going to be able to see your repair from every angle in the room and it's going to look different, lighter or darker, depending on which side you're standing on. So nap direction is very important in doing your seams. If you did a seam on a carpet and you had part of the carpet going in this direction and part of the carpet going in this direction, you see how evident that would be. And this is also a great illustration of the difference between nap direction and color problems. If there's a color problem and I'm looking at the carpet from this side and this is darker and this is lighter or vice versa, when I go to the other side of the room, the color will be the same. The light side will still be the light side. The dark side will be the dark side. If I go to the other side of the room and it's a nap direction, what will happen is it will go like this and switch light and dark sides. So it's very evident which way the nap direction is supposed to be. The paper and pencil test tells you everything you need to know as far as nap direction. And this is something we do all the time. Now once I find the nap direction, what I like to do is to take the carpet. Once I've determined the nap direction, we'll do it again just for fun. We'll say, okay, nap direction is obviously rolling in that direction. So I will take a pencil, I will flip the carpet over, and I will mark the direction the nap is going. Now, if this is an installed wall-to-wall -wall carpet, you don't need to do that. But for your donor pieces, you most definitely will. So that's nap direction 101. Pretty simple stuff, right? So that's the uh, end and conclusion of step one, nap direction. Remember, the pencil and paper test does not lie. It'll always show you where you need to be. Hi, Tom Cermak back again. We've already talked about nap direction in the carpet. Now we're going to talk about cutting the carpet, the recipient piece and the donor piece. All right, we're going to take this piece of carpet I have here, and I've marked a big X on it. We're going to say this is the damaged area in a living room. Okay, so it's the damaged area. We're going to cut it out, and it's going to receive a new piece. So this is the recipient area. And when I go into a closet or wherever I get the piece that's going to go in here, that's the donor area. And the piece that I put in here is going to be a donor going into the recipient to make the repair. So we've already determined nap direction. We've already marked nap direction on the carpet, so we know this is the nap direction. Again, like I explained to you before, I want to be on this side of the carpet. Now I'm going to show you a row finder. It's a very simple device. There are many different types. I have lots of them here. Okay, here's three different ones. This is a, actually a knitting needle and it works tremendously. But what the row finders do is you just draw a line in the carpet and it separates the fibers. So the fibers are together and we separate them with the row finder. Then when we do our cuts, we're only cutting through the back of the fiber. And that makes it so we're not sharing the tips of the fibers, which is evident after the repair. So if I was going to do this repair, now you can use a square to make your cuts square and to make sure that you're getting a nice straight line. So I had this one here. Now let's say I thought that line was really straight and it actually looked pretty good. I could then take this piece and I could row find here, trying to keep it square row find across the carpet like this to open those yarns up. Then I would do the same thing here, put this here in row find. Now a lot of people don't go through this. You'll find as you get more practiced 
that it's really easy to draw a pretty straight line in the carpet. So you've drawn your box and this is where you want to cut. You're trying to separate the yarns. Sometimes during the process, they'll push back together a little bit. This is your cushion back cutter. And this is for cutting in between the rows like this. And all you need to do is make sure that that row is clear to fiber so you're not cutting through fiber. So I take and I use it like a row finder. I drop the blade in and then I push forward. You can hear it cutting the carpet. And then I do the same thing here. I use it to make sure my line is straight and that I've cut through and separated those fibers so that when I cut, I'm not cutting the tips. And I'll cut through here doing the same thing again. Go back down to this line. And if I don't like the way the line looks, I can always readjust. I find that row with my tool. Drop my blade in. Push through. And do the same thing in the last area here. Finding my row. Okay, I like that. So I'll put that there. I'll drop my blade in and I'll cut through the carpet. Now if I've done that well, the piece lifts out. Now once in a while you'll have a little teeny line or a little piece of the backing that didn't cut. Don't grab and yank. Very gently let your knife follow the contours and break those little pieces of backing loose without damaging anything. Don't cut and rip. Don't drag. The knife should go through very smoothly and easily. Now I've removed, oops, still one little stringer there. I've removed the damaged piece. That's what I've cut out. Okay, so let's say this is the damaged piece in the living room, like I said, and we think, okay, we need a piece this big to repair it. Now I'm going to take this and move it out of the way for just a moment. Okay, so we have our damaged piece. And this is going to be the recipient area of what's going to receive the new piece. Okay, here, this is what would be in the living room ostensibly. And this is the donor piece. Now, usually, you can cut it from the surface, row finding and tracing, but you trim a lot more fibers off, especially in closets. I like to disengage a wall and just go like this and have a beautiful back area where I can cut in between the picks. Then what I'll do is I'll mark the nap direction so I remember it in the middle of where I'm going to cut the piece out because if I cut the piece out of here, that arrow is going to not be in that picture. So I want to make sure to mark the nap direction. Then I'm going to take my carpet. What I'm going to try to do is first I'm going to push the fibers in so I have a nice straight line. And I'm going to try to line it up so that when I'm making my markings, I'm marking in between the rows, the picks, so that I'm not cutting fibers. So I think I like that. And again, I'm taking the pencil and pushing the fibers back a little bit so I can get to a nice straight line from the backing. And I'm gonna mark this like this. And I'm gonna do the same thing here. And I'm gonna try to make sure that I'm getting in between a pick and lo and behold, I'm lucky it's going right in between a pick. So I should be good for that. Okay, then I'm gonna mark here doing the same thing and it looks like it's falling in between the picks as well and then last but not least i'll push in this one and do the same thing now sometimes you'll end up slightly larger in your donor piece and you can easily trim that okay i want to can't see that. so what i'm going to do because i can't see that pencil line really well is i'm going to line this up here and line this up here. I want to make sure I have a nice clean line that I can see, okay? Because it's really important that you make your cuts as exactly as possible. The closer these cuts are to the exact size of the carpet, the better your piece is going to be and the better it is, the less trimming you have to do. And I like to avoid doing trimming as much as possible. Now I did use this blade already a few times. So what I like to do, a clean sharp blades make for a beautiful cut. So I'm just going to take this blade and flip it over and put it back in. And I'm going to start, start with a nice, sharp, fresh blade. I like that. Again, I'm going to set it so that the blade is only sticking out enough to cut through the backing of the carpet because that's all we're trying to cut is the backing. So I adjust that. Set it here. Now I have a clean, fresh blade. This is the piece that was damaged. I'm going to try to cut a piece out that matches the recipient area. Now this makes a great row finder for where you want to be. And I'm just going to take this 
and push it right through like this. And I'm going to take and do the same thing here. I'm going to line it up right in that row. And I'm going to cut and I'm going to use watching this line to follow that line to make sure I'm staying straight and in the line. And that's a beautiful cut. I've got this marked in the center. So I can say, okay, boy, that's a nice straight line there. And cut it. Do the same thing here. Pretty simple, right? Boom, I have just cut my donor piece. Now let's see how well it fits and if we need to trim it or not. Okay, so there it is. Let's take the original piece, the part that was damaged we cut out, and this piece. So let's look at it like this. This is the damaged piece. We'll put that off to the side. We're going to take and brush all the fibers up and take all the loose or damaged fibers out of the equation. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is seam sealing. Seam sealing is very important. We want to make sure that we seal the edges really well, cause a good bonded insert, and we're not losing fibers later on down the road. Now, we can use a hot melt glue gun, or we can use a liquid seam sealer. I'm going to demonstrate the hot melt glue gun first. Now, the most important thing is to make sure, again, you don't have any fibers that you're going to get the glue on. You're only trying to glue together the primary and secondary backing and not get glue on the face yarns. Now, when you're doing this in a recipient area, you don't want to glue the padding to the carpet. So I like to use an awl and just slightly lift that carpet up off the pad like this. And then I can actually put my seam sealer on nice and evenly. And you have to wait about a minute or so for it to dry before you can do many. Now here, this edge is sticking up really well because the carpet's obviously not inserted well. So I can actually do the second edge here and let them both cool, again, moving that yarn out of the way so I'm not gluing it into the backing and putting my seam sealer on the edges. Now, once that is dry or cool enough to the touch that it's not gonna stick to the pad, you could do the other two edges. Um, I'm, instead of doing that, I'm going to show you using a liquid seam sealer how to do the other two edges. Now this one, you can see how it has the L shape cut into the tip so that it sits on the carpet. In fact, if I was going to do this piece, I'll do one edge on the donor piece as well. I'm going to move the carpet fibers away. I'm going to set the carpet like this. Oops, loose fiber. And you see how the carpet fits right onto that lip. And then all you do is gently squeeze the glue gun handle and it puts a thin bead of glue that seals the primary and secondary backings so you don't lose any face yarns. It's that simple, just like you did here. Now with a liquid glue, I'll show you that as well. If I take this liquid glue, let me open the bottle real quick. This has a little L-cut in the tip as well okay and same thing now this is the one i just hot glued so i'll go to this one i'm going to push the yarns away from the edge to make sure i don't get any glue on it then i'm going to take the bottle and i'm going to just get it to where i'm squeezing and i'm seeing that little bit of glue come out then i'm going to take it and i'm going to rub it while gently squeezing the bottle and putting that seam sealer running you can actually see it then i want to take my thumb and forefinger and I'm going to gently work it in so that I get a good adhesion to that primary and secondary backing so it, sees it seals it really well. And that's it. That's my seam sealer on the edges. And I can do that around the entire piece. It's very quick. Now the difference between hot melt and liquid seam sealers is liquid seam sealers, unless you're using an air mover to speed dry it, take 15 or 20 minutes for them to dry enough that you can put that insert in because your hot melt glue or any thermoplastic glue will not readily adhere to a wet glue. So you have to wait or use an air mover to speed dry it to do that. So that's the advantages and disadvantages. The thermoplastic glue, that's already dried. I can pull this all out, move it over here, stick it here, glue these two edges, wait a minute or two. Do the, do the same thing with a hot melt, and in three or four minutes I'm inserting. If I do it with a liquid latex, I'm waiting about 15 to 20 minutes 
for the latex to dry enough that I can put it together and the thermoplastic tape on either type of seam tape actually adheres to the backing of the carpet. Does that make sense? Okay, on to the next point. Okay, we're going to make sure that we're pulling all the yarns that we can away from and picking out the loose ones anywhere we see them. We want to make sure we don't have them there for later. See, there's some little ones just following us around. So I've got this. Oh, oh, there's another loose one right there. Want to make sure you get all these out. You don't want to have any trap fibers if you can avoid it. So here's our sample piece. Here's our, uh, our uh, donor piece. Next thing we would do is we would put some tape in. This is the seam tape for the cool glide with the foil backing. And it's not quite large enough, so we're going to use two pieces. Now you can basically just slide this in most carpet like this. Now what you want to do after you center it, is you want to reach in and make sure you don't have any corners flipped up that would make it not be level once it's installed. Okay, and you want to try to even them out so you have the same amount of tape on each side, about an inch to each side. Now, sometimes you might find it easiest just to go like this and put a little mark, and then when you put the piece in, you'll actually know that you have it correct when you look at that mark. You say, okay, that's about evenly spaced, and then I'm trying to divide the space in between these. So now I have these two pieces pretty evenly spaced, and I didn't mess this up too much or lose too many fibers doing that. Did get a couple that came loose. You always want to make sure it's better to spend the time whoops, getting rid of anything that could be an obstruction or in the way before you start instead of trying to fix it afterwards. So that's where we're at. Now I'll do the same thing here. Now again, we're going within that direction. So I'm going to put this end in first so that I can make sure that I have no trap fibers. Let's go around and make sure I don't have anything sticking up or out that I don't like. There's a piece dangling right there. Looks pretty good. Arrows the right way. Put that piece in. Then I'm going to gently go around and I'm going to spread the carpet between and I'm going to try to line the backings up as closely as possible like that and I'm going to work my way all the way around the piece making sure that I don't have any trapped fibers it's better to find them now than to find them after you've got it all inserted trust me so well, there were a few that were trapped move this again And I just work my way around, sometimes a couple of times around here, until I get everything just perfectly situated. I actually get to where sometimes I have a hard time seeing where my seams are when I go to uh, complete the repair. And I know that sounds funny, but I mean, it really does many times blend in so well that you can't see. And you can actually take your uh, grooming brush so it's so important that you brush it, you make sure everything looks perfect before you start. That makes it so much easier when it looks good before you start. Then you're not doing a lot of correction. Although we can do corrections, that's a great thing about the cool glide I'm always talking about. You can do corrections easily. But I prefer not to have to do any corrections. If I can get it right the first shot, that's always the better way to me. So we know that the somewhere right in this area and here and here. Now the cool glide heats between here and here. This is the center line. So it heats between here and here. Now let's see what the width of this is. It's not quite enough. Let's look at this way. Yeah, it's going to be a better fit to heat it like this. And then I'll move it over. So now I've got this set and I'm going to put it on low, not transverse. Um, this is a fairly, you know, not too thin a carpet, not too thick. Low should be more than enough. Um, you know, on a real thin commercial carpet, I would put it on the transverse setting. But here I'm going to leave it on low. I'm going to hit the uh, power button. And while it's working, I'll grab the seam weight and this. And as soon as it kicks off, 
There you go. I'm going to move it over to the other side and I'm going to hit the button again. And while it's working on that side, I'm going to seam roll it on this side and then throw my seam weight. Now it's kicked off here. So I'm going to seam roll it here and throw my seam weight here. And that just gives it a few seconds of compression. And then I'll take it and turn it this way. And I'll let it sit for a few seconds and I'll move it down. It takes, you know, 20, 30 seconds or more for this glue to really set up. So you can move the weight. All we're trying to do is compress. This is a heavy weight. So it's compressing the backing to the glue so that it gets a good adhesion between that seam tape and that backing so it stays. It's a permanent bonded insert. If you do this well, it should last as long or longer than the rest of the carpet. Your repair should be as strong or stronger than the carpet was originally made. And uh, wait, that's it. Let's see how it looks. I don't know. I think that looks pretty darn good. Well, that's it for the tips and tricks and bonded inserts and uh, this part of the uh, demonstration. I hope you enjoyed this.